tenants who were laid off or had their work hours reduced because of the coronavirus pandemic are struggling to pay the rent. The governor has imposed an eviction moratorium, but it does not guarantee rental housing. And what about landlords who rely on the monthly income? Federal money is being used to provide some relief, but what happens when it runs out? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. Many Hawaii residents are on the brink of homelessness. Some were already living paycheck to paycheck before the pandemic, and now thousands of residents are out of jobs because of COVID. Emergency funding for rent relief has been made available with an eviction moratorium in place, but there are loopholes leaving some renters with minimal options. Our panel tonight includes a tenant along with representatives from agencies assisting both renters and landlords. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Lisa Kimura is the Vice President of Community Impact at Aloha United Way. She oversees the agency's statewide 211 helpline, a free and confidential service that helps connect residents with available resources. David Chi is an attorney practicing landlord-tenant law for the past 28 years. He represents several of the largest residential landlords in the state, as well as some smaller landlords. Tracy Wilkin is the executive director of the Mediation Center of the Pacific. The nonprofit assists more than 7,000 people annually with talking, negotiating, and resolving conflicts peacefully. And Time Ventura is a renter who lives on Kauai. The mother of four is a wedding and elopement photographer whose business and income drastically dropped when the pandemic started. Let me start with you, Time. Uh, what was that like for you uh, on Kauai in particular, where the tourism industry has not really come back fully? What's it been like for you and your family? Um, to be honest, it's just, it's been so drastic and so hard. Um, probably like a lot of viewers out there, my husband and I um, were both working and pretty much living paycheck to paycheck. And um, my job, I'm sure as well as many other viewers out there is, was deemed um, non-essential and was directly hit. Uh, the majority of my clients are tourists and tourists really have been closed off from the island. So uh, my my whole business has has collapsed. What's the uh, been the situation with your housing then? I mean, that's that's what this show, shows about. Uh, yeah, so uh, my husband and I rent and um, Luckily, he is in the medical field, and so his job has been secure, and he's pulled um, as a lot of the slack, and um, we've just tried to uh, cut every corner possible and just do everything we can to uh, make, you know, make ends meet. And uh, uh, luckily, a friend of ours um, recommended the rental relief program, which I had no even awareness of and we applied and um, it was a tremendous, tremendous help for us. Well, that's great. Now that gives us a nice segue to uh, Lisa Kimura from Aloha United Way who, who actually helps operate that program along with the 211 system. Tell me what's it been like for your agency? I mean, we were talking earlier, how much rent relief have you folks put out and what impact did that have on your agency in terms of growth? Yeah, I mean, as far as the need, it's enormous. And honestly, there's just not enough support to help the number of people that need it. So over the course of the last year, we helped combine over 15,000 households with several different programs. We've increased staff. I mean, we're, we're getting our two in one line is getting a 600% sustained increase in call volume. Not only are people needing housing and shelter, which is our number one request, but more people than ever are needing help with food, with healthcare. I mean, that used to be something that people didn't even really inquire as much about. Um, but with losing their em employment, they're also losing their health care. So we've had a humongous increase in our staffing as a result just to be able to keep up with it. Um, what kind of, how much calls do you get from people who are distressed about the rent situation? 
it's really our number one call. So about 40% of our call volume are people that are looking for help. So whether it's people that are worried about eviction, worried about paying their rent, worried about paying their mortgage, not sure what they're gonna do. Um, there's, there's all kinds of situations and it's very difficult to be able to get the support for people, especially if they don't exactly qualify for the programs that are out there. But with that said, you know, this state, the state of Hawaii has been the number one in the nation per capita for rent distribution, rent assistance distribution. So it's an enormous accomplishment, but the need is still out there. You know, David Chi, uh, attorney representing landlords, has that rental assistance been something that has been also a godsend for landlords? Well, certainly for the landlords who get it, it has been fantastic. Um, not all landlords have been able to get them uh, get it. And as you probably know, initially when the program began, um, there was a flood of people who applied. And I think it was within a very short period after the program opened, uh, the program closed uh, because there were, too, there were too many applicants. So something in the neighborhood of 2,000 um, applicants or so uh, at, at, at managed to get their applications in. And after that, then the, the program pretty much um, stopped taking applications. So for those landlords whose uh, tenants um, actually applied and got approved, uh, yeah, godsend. Um, let me ask Lisa, uh, what is the status of the program now? Is it something people can still apply for or is it indeed closed down? And are there other alternatives right now? There are some alternatives out there, yes, but they're very minimal. Um, the good news is there is another set of rent relief monies coming. Um, but as far as the current programs uh, that were funded by the CARES Act, they're currently closed. So we did, along with Catholic Charities through the state rent assistance program, we distributed $60 million over a six month period. Um, Tracy Wilgood from the Mediation Center. Um, what's been your experience in terms of, uh, you set up a program, as I recall, to help landlords and tenants work it out because it's, even though you don't, can't get evicted, that doesn't mean you should stop paying rent, right? So uh, what, what's been your experience with renters and landlords in your agency? Yeah, you're exactly right. At the start of COVID, we created a rapid response landlord tenant mediation program to encourage landlords and tenants to talk and work out payment plans that would benefit both landlord and tenant. Unfortunately, with the moratorium, a lot of them and being overwhelmed with everything going on, which is <clears throat> understandable, um, a lot of them didn't want to mediate. We did mediate some, but when you look at the volume of potential cases versus what we did mediate, it was not proportional. Um, when Aloha United Way and Catholic Charities then had um, handled the rental assistance program last year, um, we received over 700 uh, referrals to mediation, which we followed up on all of them. Those that were able to get rental assistance declined mediation. They said later on when the moratorium lifts, we'll come back and talk to you. Um, but right now we are, we've been receiving, we received about close to 700 referrals from Catholic Charities more recent program. And they're starting to, um, agree to participate in mediation. So we have cases scheduled um, every week for the next few weeks. So what, they are the, starting to talk. What, what's the um, circumstances that brings people to mediation? Is it just, um, I owe more than I can afford, and, but my landlord doesn't want to evict me? You know, what, what, what's a typical case look like to you? A typical case oftentimes is landlords and tenants aren't talking or maybe the landlord attempted to reach out, the tenant didn't trust or was embarrassed um, or was having other challenges, so wasn't responsive. Um, so a lot of what we've seen when we get them in is, is helping them start having conversations about the reality of their situation and how they can work together to set up payment plans. Is the, is the landlord willing to reduce the rent? Is the landlord willing to waive some of the back rent? Does the tenant, um, what are they looking at as far as um, additional income coming in? And, and right now it's also talking about the future um, because if they don't talk about the future, when that moratorium lifts, there potentially could be thousands of evictions and none of us want to see that happen. Uh, Time Ventura, you know, as a renter, um... How much stress is there associated with that? I mean, I, I'm lucky I own my place, but 
Uh, what's it like when your income goes down and, and you really aren't entirely sure you're going to be able to keep your housing? Is, did that ever go through your mind? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, it's 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 stressful. It's it's frightening. It's um, it's it's just very intimidating. Uh, your home is your, you know, your safety place. Um, it's your stability. And especially when you have kids and especially when so much is changing in the world and, uh, you know, unstable and unknown to um, to have a place that you know you're going to to have your place of stability threatened, I think, is one of the worst feelings. Um, David Chi, in terms of what you've seen, um, has there been a difference between how a big land landlord, uh, a, a owner of many units, and a smaller one um, has to deal with these things? I mean, take me through, like, what's it like for a real small guy that may only own one or two units versus a really big guy who owns hundreds? I think that if you are, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that most tenants have tried really hard to pay the rent. Um, and so if you are a, a landlord with one unit, you might just be really lucky and your tenant might be doing everything that they can, even if they've had an impact on their job, um, borrowing money, you know, taking out from savings, you know, working extra jobs um, to pay the rent. And so those landlords really have, um, you know, the lucky ones are the are the ones whose tenants have, and you know, many tenants haven't been affected at all. And, you know, people who are in the military who work for the government, um, a lot of them still have their steady incomes. Um, the larger landlords I, I've seen is they have a, a broader spectrum of the of the um, population living in their units, and so as a result, um, all the uh, the large landlords are affected in some way. Um, because some significant proportion of their uh, tenants um, have lost their jobs. So I'm seeing, you know, that the larger landlords are the ones that, you know, for sure are, are suffering. Um, but I know that uh, for the small landlords, um, some of them are suffering badly, um, but some of them are not suffering at all. Uh, from an attorney's point of view, how does it, how does the uh, moratorium on eviction play into this equation if if most people do want to pay their rent and it's really not in the best interest of a landlord to lose a tenant who's actively trying to pay their rent is the eviction moratorium really a factor in 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 this um phenomenon yeah it's a it's a very large factor um what we see is that there is a segment of the populace that is not trying to pay their rent so I had one client, for example, that was renting out a 10,000 a month beachfront house to an executive um, whose income was not affected. But when the, in, when the moratorium came up, that executive decided to not pay the rent because he knew that he was going to be moving in a couple months anyway. So he didn't pay the rent and left and uh, left the landlord holding the bag on this huge, huge debt. Um, and so the, the moratorium has, has had that effect. Um, and the moratorium has had the other effect of um, now, in the past, I think that tenants generally would try to pay their rent very, very uh, quickly so that they didn't fall behind. Many landlords had a threshold where if the tenant owed more than, say, $1,000, then the tenants, uh, the tenants would get evicted. And usually, you know, tenants would know what that threshold was and try to keep their rent uh, arrearage below that threshold. Um, that's kind of gone. So now uh, tenants are much more likely to um, to uh, allow the arrearage to grow larger uh, than that threshold amount. So you see across the board larger arrearages um, on on the part of landlords. Although, like I said, many tenants are, are trying their best to to keep that arrearage at a minimum. Tracy Wilkin with the Mediation Center. Uh, it sounds like you've seen that same phenomenon. Um, is that why you're saying you now you see more cases because that arrearage has grown and they want to do something about it, but they also don't feel like they could pay the whole thing? Is that a fairly typical situation? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, as, as everyone said, tenants want to pay their rent and they want to be able to stay in their residence. So, um, <clears throat> and oftentimes it's difficult for them to 
approach their landlord. They're embarrassed, it's not their fault, they lost their job. But through mediation, um, we help them start talking about the situation and, and we can reality test people as mediators that um, there's a lot of people out there and the rents are gonna go down um, because the economy is bad. So um, there's negotiating on both sides. So um, we are seeing more um, cases in mediation. And one of the things, some of the cases that we've had, uh, the landlord was relieved to hear how hard the tenant was working to try and pay their rent. Like some of them didn't even know that the tenant had applied for rental assistance. And when they heard that, it was like, oh, I, you know, I, I just thought you weren't doing anything. So then they start working together, which is really what we want. Um, uh, Lisa Kibura with Aloha United Way. Where, when, once the uh, program started rolling out, there was a sort of an unintended consequence, I think, that was discovered in that there were some landlords that didn't want to cooperate, even though it meant money for them. What, what was going on there? It's, it's difficult to speculate what the situation is for everybody. Um, you know, certainly some people were very sensitive about disclosing their personal information. They didn't know where it was going to go. They didn't know what was happening with it. A lot of times, and, and, and I think the difficulty was it required a lot of conversations with those landlords, which of course takes time away from the processing of applications. And when you're looking at 18,000 in the queue, it's it, it just takes that much longer. And so to have the follow up with people and help them understand what it is and it's to their benefit and um, it, it just, it, it was a complex situation. Is the fact though that, I've always gotten the impression that Hawaii's rental market was way more decentralized than a lot of places. I, I've lived in cities where you could just get out, walk out of the subway and there's four or five apartment buildings right around. You just walk around and look at them. They've got model units and, and so on, and professional management. But it always struck me, Hawaii has got so many little individual condo units that they're hard to find. You've got to go through a, uh, a, a newspaper ad, I, I don't know if anybody remembers newspaper ads, and uh, you know, to find, find these units. Is that, Lisa, kind of part of the thing? Is that there's just so many individual landlords and individual tenants out there, yeah. as opposed to people dealing with big institutional type of renting places? That's definitely a big factor. I'm sure David has more data on on the breakdown. But for us, you know, originally we thought that it would be helpful, at least from our finance department and our, and our processing speed, to be able to get the account information and, and monitor which property management companies we were using and and be able to batch payments and things. But no, truly, it was just so many one off individual landlords that own one or a couple of units. Um, so it really didn't simplify the process very much at all. Um, David. It on that on that point, I mean, is the um, the decentralized nature of this this market uh, is that a big issue? Well, especially with that uh, program that ended, um, you know, that program just kind of came about out of out of thin air almost. Um, and I think that the amount of you know testing and planning for that program was really limited just because of the circumstances of it. Um, the end result, I think, was that the, there were many, many landlords who didn't really know about what the program was. And so when you get somebody trying to get, you know, your social security number from you in order to issue you a check, you know, it, it, it might sound like a Nigerian scam. Um, so I, I think that there, you know, there was that aspect to it. Um, I think also that, that um, a lot of landlords, you know, not everybody is uh, good with English. Um, a lot of things, you know, there were a lot of um, imp a lot of impediments, I think, you know, to the program. And I'm not saying that it was at anybody's fault. It's just that when you're dealing with so many people and with so many different levels of sophistication, I think it's inevitable that you're going to have a difficult time. Uh, well, I got you on, on the line, David. Um, one question at the that came up here is, as a landlord, how much am I legally able to recoup? Mike from Makiki. Um, how easy it is, it is it to get the money back from a tenant? You mentioned that story about a high-end tenant that just said, oh, I don't have to pay my rent. Um, how easy it is to get that money back? Well, um, it really depends. Um, if you get a tenant who has a, you know, a good paying job and just decided he doesn't want to pay you just because he doesn't want to pay you, 
um, there are the entire court system is set up to get judgments and garnish people and get your money back. Um, it's not easy. Um, and I'd say, you know, it's, it's rarely an easy thing to do, but especially if you have a tenant who doesn't have a job or, you know, is, has done their best and is basically out of, of money, um, and has no foreseeable future of getting money. Um, the likelihood of getting paid back, I think is, is pretty small. So to hire a lawyer wouldn't be worth the money because you would just never Well, you should back. always hire lawyers, I think. But <laughs> okay. that said, um, I, I do think that, um, you know, at least when, uh, when times were normal, you know, before COVID, we would evaluate cases, uh, you know, as to whether or not the landlord should go and seek uh, a judgment for the money that's owed. And we would look at the situation and we would say, well, you know, is there any likelihood that you're going to get this back anytime soon? You know, and if, if the tenant was just, you know, down on their luck and not likely to get another job, you know, often I would tell clients, hey, maybe you should just pass. This one just doesn't seem to be worth the money um, to go get. But, you know, if it's um, somebody who, you know, has a successful business and they just decided that they, they just didn't want to pay you because they just didn't want to pay you. Yeah, those are the guys you go to court to go and do the collection on. Time, uh, I imagine that you had, to, in order, it sounds like you're the kind of tenant they're talking about who really wanted to pay the rent, make sure you had your house. Um, what kind of sacrifices did you have to make elsewhere in your life in order to make sure you, you covered your rent? Um, gosh, just daily, uh, even necessities. I have four daughters and, um, you know, clothing, items just making do with what we have um one daughter uh stopped attending and uh, just finding different ways for education um community college versus a larger university um we just smaller everything just how, cuts and everything you mind if i ask how, how old are um, your daughters so my oldest daughter is a 20 and my youngest is seven. So how did you explain to the seven-year-old what was going on? Oh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, just, just trying to be honest. Um, but for a, my seven-year-old had one year, uh, she was, she was in um, kindergarten. So she experienced a little bit of normal schooling and then it was an abrupt stop and, and, and then now mass and, um, just you know trying to be honest and and age appropriate when questions arise and sometimes the answer uh, it I, I have felt it's okay to say I don't know or we're working that out or not now <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> um, let me throw this out I'm not sure who is the best person to um, answer this question but I want to honor the questions from the viewers, does anybody realize that the eviction moratorium, rent relief, stimulus money, mortgage forbearance, and home buying mania is making rent on Hawaii Island much worse, causing a tight rental market and skyrocketing prices? Um, any, uh, David, I mean, what impact do you, are we seeing that, that there's actually a crunch in rentals as opposed to people moving out or people letting go of rentals? There are problems because um, I'm hearing from my clients that a lot of properties that they had been managing are being sold by their owners because um, there's a I mean there's there's two competing pressures. One pressure is that there's no end in sight to the moratoriums, and so the risk of of losing their income from their rental is significant. And on top of that, um, the prices for houses are are going through the roof. So there is every incentive for somebody who, you know, a small landlord to sell their property rather than to um, fight on and, and hope that uh, they can uh, resume the rental business. Has that been happening? Yes. Because you can, yes. evict, you can evict someone if you're selling the property, right? It's sort of a big issue, isn't it? Yeah. In the way, um, there's some limitations on it, but under uh, Hawaii's emergency laws, uh, one of the ways that you can terminate a month-to-month -month tenancy is after you have sold the property. So once the property has been sold for, you know, to a bona fide purchaser for money, 
um, that next owner can terminate the tenancy um, of whoever it is that was occupying the, the property. Um, uh, Tra so, Tracy, yeah. The, Tracy Wilkin from the uh, Mediation Center. Have you seen cases like that where um, people have just uh, sold a property rather than deal with a tenant? Yes. And, and then what happens, so they're, they sell the property rather than deal with the tenant. The tenant's trying to figure out where they're going to move, but then the landlord wants back payment from the tenant. So um, it kind of adds salt to the wound. Well, it also sounds like a very difficult thing to resolve. <laughs> yeah, in some instances, you know, the tenant wants to do, I mean, well, I shouldn't say in some instances, the tenants want to do the right thing. Some of them are just so overwhelmed and so um, behind that, you know, they've moved, they figured this is, this is it. Um, but some of them have actually been willing to mediate with the landlord. You know, it's, not that they're trying to take advantage of the landlord and they have worked out payment plans, even though the landlord sold the property and the tenant had to move out. So we see all, all variations. Do, does, the, does, the, does the moratorium on evictions though give the, um, the tenant an upper hand in something like this? Well, yes, when they, for other reasons besides, so a landlord can't evict the tenant for not paying rent with the moratorium. So in some instances, yeah, tenants say they can't evict me, so I'm trying to focus on other things, so I'm not going to deal with the landlord right now because I'm safe. And I think that's one of the reasons besides there is um, larger and larger amounts of back rent owed, but because the moratorium, it's supposed to, the state moratorium is supposed to end um, on February 14th, whether that will happen or not. Um, and then, of course, the federal moratorium goes to March 31. So, and this, we see this trend, we've seen this trend over the last year. Every time it comes close, people start talking, and then it gets extended, they stop. Yeah, unintended consequences. Uh, Lisa Kimura from Aloha United Way. How has the calls, how have the calls changed um, as these different changes come in? You, your folks have to keep track of all these different changes in the programs. Are you still getting a lot of calls about housing? Oh, yeah. yeah housing was always our number one source of, of inquiry, usually around 30 to 33 percent of our calls, but it has increased. And especially when these programs were announced, you know, up to half of our calls were related to housing assistance. Um, so our 211 staff has had to keep up. We went from a staff of five to up to 25. Um, so just goes to show, and that's, that's just to be able to answer all the calls that are coming in. Um, but we do know people are trying to prioritize their housing. They will let other things go just to be able to survive and have a roof over their head. But with, with that said, when you've lost your employment and we have record unemployment, especially on neighbor islands, there are people now that more than ever have not been able to, to uh, make ends meet, be able to have food. Uh, we have worse problems with food insecurity. And I would really commend all of the community groups that are out there that are establishing wonderful supports, especially for those that are uh, homebound or kupuna who cannot travel. Um, there's, there's incredible resources that, are, that, have, that have developed, but the need just continues to grow. And again, with, with healthcare, we have people calling more for government assistance, government services, um, just, a, just really kind of a sense of desperation. And people are, after many months of unemployment, are really getting to the end of their lifeline. You know, um, on that point, though, how much advice can you, your staff give to someone, or do you tend to refer them off to somewhere else? And is there any real gap in the available services right now for folks out there that you're seeing? Absolutely. We are an information and referral service. So rather than give advice, we connect them to the people that can give them advice and information. Um, kind of a... a, a point of comparison is we used to refer an average of one to two employ uh, one to two referral sources per call. Now it's up to about four to five per call. So it just goes to show the increase in the need and in the, the breadth of needs that people have. What I'm wondering about, you know, for anyone who wants to pitch in here, the unemployment system that we had in this state was completely antiquated. It basically collapsed at first and they've been cobbling it back together 
just like with housing, different unemployment programs have popped up and been implemented and then phased and moved to another one. It's been quite confusing. How has the um, confusion and difficulty in mm -hmm. unemployment, are most tenants able to, that are not working, getting unemployment support? And what's happening when the people just don't, aren't getting unemployment support? Are they just carrying carrying on without paying any rent? Um, David, do, do, have you seen anything about, like that? Yeah, people are carrying on by not paying the rent. I mean, it's it's an easy decision to make. Um, I tend to think that people respond to the wolf that's closest to the door. The governor has kept this particular wolf very far away. So um, I, I, you know, if you're prioritizing, um, am I going to put gas in my car so I can get to work? Or am I going to am I going to pay the rent? Um, I'm pretty sure you're going to put the gas in your car. You know, I have a question, and, and this may be, again, for you, uh, David, a lot of legal questions are coming in. Um, if squatters are on a property, are they protected from eviction? Um, first off, what's the difference between a squatter and someone who's in there but not paying? I guess squatter would be someone who wasn't even invited to move there in the first place. Can a landlord or an owner get rid of squatters in, under the current scheme of regulation? Yeah, the difference, if I could draw a distinction, the, dis, um, the difference between somebody who's a squatter and somebody who's a tenant is that there's no landlord-tenant relationship, meaning that there was never an agreement that the person could stay there in exchange for rent. So if some you know, stranger shows up and, you know, and occupies a, a property that you own, um, you don't know who they are, you don't have any agreement with them, they are a squatter, yes, you can evict them. That type of action is called an ejectment action and is the type of thing that you can do when a tenant, when a, excuse me, a non-tenant is occupying your, your, your property. Can you get Whereas the help? if it's a, I'm can, sorry? Can you get the help from the police in a situation like that? Police will generally, well, I shouldn't say, you know, it's, um, I would say that, that the response of the police is, is not necessarily consistent. Sometimes they will help, sometimes they won't. Um, all, the thing I hear often when people have asked the police to help is, that they don't want to get involved because it's a civil matter. Oftentimes, somebody who doesn't belong there will simply tell the police, oh, I, I have a rental agreement. And it's not like the policeman knows, you know, and doesn't want to get involved in something that uh, maybe he should not be, he or she should not be getting involved in. So uh, then it's left to the courts to deal with. Um, another question from a, from a viewer, this one, Carl from Ever Beach. Um, has a suggestion. Talk about solutions, not the problem. The state should organize a program that will recruit laid off workers to do cleaning, repair, and yard services for residents who need those services and are willing to pay. Um, Lisa Kimura, is, is there anything out there? Are you able to help with employment issues and helping people find jobs? Or are people finding jobs and work in this economy? And, and what do you think of that idea from Carl? Well, that's definitely an interesting idea. And I think innovation is the name of the game these days because things are not going to be the same for a very long time. And we've had, you know, from our very historic high unemployment rate, we've been able to improve a little bit. But again, tourism is not recovering anytime soon. And we, Aloha United Way, had released the ALICE report. Um, we've re released a couple of them. ALICE, of course, is an acronym that stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed meaning the, the individuals, families, households in our state that are working often multiple jobs, but still not making ends meet. So with the ALICE initiative, what we have been working on now for several years with our nonprofit partners, with our corporate partners, with government agencies, with government partners, is to be able to develop a system an ecosystem really of, a, of upward mobility for people economically. So having job opportunities, having job counseling, knowing how to find jobs and how, knowing how to create industry in this state that's gonna sustain livable wages for people. Because we've always had jobs. We've never had prior to this a problem with, you know, with not being able to have enough employment. However, the issue for us has always been having employment that is able to keep people living and, and sustainable and being able to afford our cost of living, being able to afford housing. And the report outlined exactly what would happen if we had some kind of disaster or crisis. And it's really, really exacerbated all of those vulnerabilities. Uh, time to mature. I'm curious, we talk about people changing jobs and so on. You're a photographer, which is a, 
a, a great fun job. It's a great people job, especially when you're doing weddings, uh, people's, you know, at the, the, the most delightful time of their lives. Have you actually had to think about finding something else to do for a living because of this? And, and like they're saying, the prospects are, are kind of out there. Uh, how's that been going? Have you been able to see anything on the horizon or do, do different uh, things? Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, um, I was just talking to my husband about that this morning. You know, it's like holding on for hope. Um, how long can we possibly make it? How long, you know, every time the Kauai is open, Kauai opened up in November, I was just so excited um, at the possibility. Then we close again, or now these weird bubbles. And so it's, it's looking like, again, um, becoming inventive and, and, and trying to figure out a way. But one thing I want to say that's has been a challenge for me, I created a business where I could work from home so I could be a mother. And now, additionally, I'm finding myself having to school my children. Um, and that's taken a big part of the time that I would use. My kids would go to school and I worked um, towards doing that responsibility. Um, so, but definitely, um, the, the problem is, too, that I see on Kauai, so many jobs are tourist related. Another job that I used to have, I taught in schools. That's also very limited and very hard now. So um, it's definitely not as easy as it sounds to just get out there and, you know, um, but also I believe, I think it's very important to, to be proactive and to try and problem solve and move or, or change if necessary, which I'm, I am open to. Um, let me, uh, a couple more questions coming in. Again, these are questions that tend to be somewhat legal. Um, what can a tenant that is on limited income and is unable to pay rent do? Property owner did not deemed, oh, denied Section 8 application. Um, Lisa Kimura, um, right now, are there any um, programs for, for new people who need new assistance? I mean, is there anything out there right now where someone who can't pay their rent can get aid right now? If people call 211, we do have a very limited list with very limited entry um, at some nonprofits that offer that. The new uh, rental assistance money that's coming through each of the counties is going to have some. Um, it's it, it will be opening it up. Uh, soon, but it's not open yet. Okay, and uh, Tracy Wilkin from the um, Mediation Center, uh, this sounds like a job for you. Uh, Ken in Honolulu, I have some tenants who refuse to apply for assistance and are delinquent thousands of dollars. I'm willing to help them apply, but they refuse. What can be done to handle this? Uh, are you seeing situations like that as well? You sounds like you're seeing all kinds of situations. But. Yeah, absolutely. I would suggest that he contact the media. If he's on Oahu, there's community mediation centers on every island. If he's on a different island, um, contact the mediation center on the island where he resides. And what, what will happen is we'll take his information. He'll give us the name and contact information of the tenants. We will reach out to the tenants to help them understand why it's valuable for them to participate in mediation, um, why it's important for them to consider it. There's no cost to any of them. Um, it's relatively painless and easy process. So usually we have more success um, encouraging somebody to participate when you have a situation like that. So um, once again, your service is a, is a free service. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, and then. So you'll actually kind of call up someone and say, you know, it's in your interest to come down and do this because your landlord is getting ready to fill in the blank, right? Um, yeah. uh, uh, David Chi, what do you think of that situation where you've mentioned there are renters that are just refusing uh, and they are currently delinquent? Uh, what, what do you think? I'm willing to help them apply. If there's not much available. So, uh, I mean, what would you do in a situation like that? Well, it, it, it bears um, saying that the state of Hawaii is scheduled to get like some $200 million in rent relief um, in the not too distant future. Well, I'm not exactly sure when it's going to roll out, 
but it's going to be, you know, hopefully it'll roll out soon. Um, in, is that in, sorry, let me, see, is that in, is that in the, the last stimulus thing or is that in the one that's being discussed? Which is it always was in the thing. last one, the, the most, the December one. And my understanding of the world is that um, I've been talking with um, Professor Garboden from the University of Hawaii, one of the Uhiro um, professors, and his indication was that he estimated that something in the neighborhood of $55 million is owed in back rent by residential tenants in Hawaii. So, and the most recent indicators are that that, that new money can be used towards the back rent. So if in fact the um, that money comes through and if in fact it can be used for back rent, um, almost the entire back rent um, problem can be resolved um, through use of that money if only people apply. Um, Lisa, so, are you hearing about that, that money coming in and do you have any idea how it'll be delivered? I mean, it would, make, it would make sense for your folks with the existing organization and the existing expertise to do it, but right now you've got no guarantee that that's the way it's going to operate. Is that correct? Well, we do know at least for the city and county of Honolulu, it will be 122 million, Maui County 40 million, um, and then the rest split up uh, for that 200 million throughout the state. Um, right now, it's really a matter of determining who all is going to administer, how it's going to be administered, interpreting the Treasury Department's rules. That was definitely one of the challenges the first go around in 2020. The emergency, the nature of emergency funding was that it got out very quickly. Unfortunately, the details around the requirements, the eligibility um, were not necessarily solidified up front. And so the amount of uh, discussion that needed to take place, the amount of debate, the amount of changes were very challenging for all of the organizations that were administering it. And I think a lot of lessons were learned definitely between the, the couple of different programs that, that came out between county level and state level um, and, and improvements were made, but it was tough. And even still, as we're now wrapping up the end of that program, and again, getting out with the state program, $60 million in a very short amount of time was not easy at all, but it happened. Um, but now the, the, the wrap up of all of that presents all kinds of additional challenges. Yeah, people people think that government already oh, that's all they know how to do is spend money, but in fact they really don't know how to spend money very well. But but let me continue, Lisa, with that thought though. Do you expect though that this is going to be tranches of money that's going to go to the government, and then they'll have the choice of what organizations are going to be distributing it? Right. Yeah. Um, so that's the discussions that are taking place right now, and again, how it's going to be administered. Um, who is going to do it? A lot of that's just being figured out. It takes an enormous amount of staff. I mean, people think that you can, you know, snap your fingers and, and put the money in people's pockets. It's not that easy. And I know that's overstating it, but but honestly, there is so much to be considered down to the most minute of details. And people really have the best of intentions. I, our government does want to help people. Our nonprofit organizations want to help people, but it takes a lot of time and discussion to make it happen appropriately. Um, time, I, that's kind of like the best news I've heard in a little bit. I mean, I vaguely knew that there was some money, but I didn't realize it was quite that much. And when you compare it to how much was available, are you feeling like you're hearing a little bit of good news here? Yeah, I actually had no idea um, that that was available or would be coming available. So I would really encourage um, families in our situation who are just barely able to pay rent and even in worse circumstances to reach out to really call and and contact and find um, find out what your options are. Uh, Tracy uh, Wilkin from the Mediation Center, you know, as, um, as, as we move forward with this, do you see um, some hope for for this this situation yeah a absolutely i mean that's why we've been encouraging people to mediate you know prior to covid um when people were being evicted we had a mediation program on site at court these were 20 minute mediations and yet i was surprised to see that even though the eviction process was in place 50 percent of those people they reached agreements, 22% got to stay, the other moved out but had more time and it was a 
it was a, with a lot more dignity as opposed to being evicted within 24 or 48 hours. So, um, you know, looking at that type of experience and, you know, everybody's going through the most difficult times in their lives and nobody knows how to deal with it because nobody's been through this before. Um, and so just bringing people together and having them have conversations and recognizing that they're as stressed out as the other. The landlord's going through their stresses, the tenant's going through their stresses, and you know they really do want to work together. So I, I see a lot of hope, and I'm, I'm really happy that we're seeing more people taking advantage of mediation. Uh, David Chi, uh, one thing that, uh, I got this question fairly early, um, and it, uh, it was an issue that had come up, what about landlords with no general excise tax license? I mean, obviously, as you were describing, some of these folks may not have excise tax licenses, but it's a legitimate landlord tenant, you know, operation. What kind of advice would you have, and maybe it's too late for the government, of how they could tweak this program to make it work better for both landlords and tenants as, as more aid starts coming down? It's not so, so much about general excise tax licenses. I mean, to me, um, all landlords, I mean, everybody, you should pay your taxes. Everybody should pay their taxes. They should, you know, general excise taxes. I know that there was a lot of speculation that uh, landlords were not participating in um, these rent relief programs because they were trying to evade uh, the general excise tax. Um, that never really made too much sense to me because landlords that have a lot of property um, they have a lot to lose. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, that if you're relying on the government to protect your property rights, then you can um, go about cheating the government of its taxes and expect that the, the system is going to last very long. And you're not going to get very much uh, sympathy from a court if, um, if that's what you've been doing. But in terms of making the, the, the programs work better, I think that a lot was learned from the last one. And I think that if... Um, the last program was was largely uh, build a canoe while you're paddling through the uh, Molokai Channel uh, kind of situation, um, and it was it was just difficult. Um, I think a lot was learned, and uh, one of the things that that I found was that um, if there's a lot more coordination between the landlords and the um, the program managers, that I think that they that you're more likely to get a um, a faster result. Um, I was working with the uh, uh, with the state office um, that was administering the program and providing them with you know lists of clients that um, uh, that I represented so that they would have like a one stop shop if they needed um, uh, they needed contact information for my clients I could I, you know, I could facilitate that so that was you know I thought that that was um, something that was helpful for the for the program helpful for my clients. Um, and and helpful for their tenants. So I think it's just a matter of coordination. And now that that we've gone through that experience once, I'm hoping that that ex that uh, experience that was learned um, can be applied again in the future. Uh, Lisa Kimura from Aloha United Way. I'd like to ask you the same question: If if you could have a lot of influence, what would you tell them that they should do a little differently this time around? I think off the bat, the first thing is just to, to be able to have an ease in which applications can be processed and, and simplifying and streamlining the requirements and how to uh, how to get them. For example, the people that were already the lowest income, who were already who were pre uh, predominantly affected by our unemployment challenges. They were people who were often not, they did not have bank accounts in the first place or did not have bank accounts where they could uh, access statements. And so to be able to prove assets was extremely challenging. Proving assets in, you know, at all when it comes to being able to access resources and support is also a problem. Um, originally, one of the issues was, or one of the requirements was that every adult in the household needed to be able to certify their assets in order to, to maintain below a threshold. Well, certainly that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because limiting assets uh, reduces the ability for people to. Uh, I, I got to stop you there. So in that last thing, there was an asset test? I always thought you just had to say, I can't pay my rent for whatever reason, that they, there was an asset was test involved? 
That was one thing that the state learned um, from. And so that was not part of the next rent relief program that, that rolled out. And that was a, a, a very wise choice, not only because again, limiting people is, is difficult for a lot of reasons, um, but also when you have say, mother, child, or siblings, or unrelated adults in a household who do not want to disclose their financial information to each other, it put applications on almost a permanent hold. So that was one uh, major consideration. Um, increasing the area median income threshold. So uh, the, the state rent program was for people at 100% of the AMI or below. That was a very reasonable threshold um, for people to be able to, to access the support. Um, and, and, and just being able to be flexible in what types of documentation could be provided to illustrate the situation. There's, there's a lot of reasons why people could not qualify at all, but um, you know, a kind of, I guess, a classic example that I would think of that required a whole lot of discussion to be able to come to an agreement on um, were single parents who left their employment to homeschool their children because their children were not in school. They were not, in a traditional sense, affected uh, economically in that they were not forced out of their job, they were not laid off, but they could not continue their employment and therefore had no income. Um, so that is a very typical example of why in the original set of uh, the procedures, they didn't apply, but, but you know, again, with reasonable discussion and a lot of back and forth um, uh, conversation about it, we were able to adjust things like that. Time, uh, you, you actually are the consumer who actually went through this process. Uh, what was it like applying for this? And, and was, it, was there a lot of paperwork involved? And do you think that other people might be discouraged by the amount of paperwork or the kind of questions that were being asked? You know, um, when I was the friend first uh, asked or mentioned to apply, I was scared because of the paperwork and the process and do I have enough to, I know there are people even worse off than us and do will we qualify? And I was so pleasantly surprised at the process that, um, that we went through. It was almost predominantly online. It felt very straightforward. It felt very um, just simple, as simple as possible to provide what was needed. Um, and I was really encouraged by that. Actually, and, thinking about it, I don't mean to interrupt yeah. you, but I'm going to interrupt you, sorry. But, yeah. but you also were a small business owner, right? So you, yeah. you had to keep your paperwork. You had to have bank mm -hmm. accounts. You probably had to pay excise tax. So you probably had pretty good records. So it was fairly easy for you. But did they ask a lot of questions about family income and stuff? Or? Um, it, it wasn't. No, there weren't like 300 questions. I mean, I felt very, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recollect exactly. It, it felt very um, straightforward and, and minimal. You know, it didn't feel like, like I had to list t thousands of things. It mm -hmm. felt very to the point and, and doable. So uh, I, I, yeah. David G um, is a representative of landlords. Uh, were landlords willing to go to these programs uh, to ask for help for their tenants? Or was, oh, yeah. was that, oh, that, okay, a lot of people did that. Yeah, no, in fact, uh, my, my clients generally publicize the program to their tenants, encourage their, their, their tenants to, to, um, to apply, and provided the paperwork to the tenants to help them apply. So if my clients could have um, filled out all the paperwork for the tenants, I'm pretty sure they would have, because the landlords are the ones getting the money. Uh, Tracy Wilkin from uh, from the Mediation Center, uh, are you do you expect that once this new amount of money comes in, that people will hopefully come in and start negotiating uh, settlements? Yes, absolutely. And, and finally, Lisa Kimura, if you could um, finish this out here, we've only got a couple minutes. Uh, remind us all of what people should be doing if either they can't pay their rent or they have a tenant who, who can't pay their rent. What should they do? Well, as soon as, well, in the meantime, until the new programs open up, you know, definitely calling Aloha United Way 211 is one way to access support. And whether it's an actual rent or mortgage assistance program that's out there, whether it's finding some type of shelter, whether it's finding mediation services, et cetera, that can all be accessed, as well as all kinds of wraparound services and support that they might need. 
Um, when the new rent programs do come out, I think it's really important for people to understand how quickly uh, the line of people accumulates. And so to have your financial information available um, it, right now, again, the details are being worked out, but being able to have proof of your economic impact from COVID, um, whether that's filing for unemployment, whether that's having a notification from your employer, or whether it's having a, a market decrease in your business income, things like that, um, to be able to demonstrate, being able to move quickly on it, um, being able to have an open and honest relationship with your landlord. We definitely had landlords that were calling to check in on their tenants' applications, which we did not release that information directly to them, but we understand very well okay. um, how how you know desperate some people feel. So having that having that uh, conversation is important up front. Great advice. Thank you so much. And we want to thank all our guests tonight, Lisa Kimura from Aloha United Way, Attorney David Chi, Tracy Wiltgen from the Mediation Center of the Pacific, and Kauai resident Time Ventura. Thank all of you very much. Next week on Insights, there's a major push to get youth sports started again. What needs to happen to get our keiki back out on the playing field? Please join us then. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.